This episode of The Prosecutors is brought to you by Huggies Little Movers. Get your baby's butt in a Huggies best fitting diaper. Huggies Little Movers, we got you, baby. Hello, I'm Rabia Chaudhary. I invite you to join me every Tuesday for new episodes of Nighty Night, Bedtime Stories to Keep You Awake, now on Podcast One. This new incarnation of Nighty Night is an anthology of stories that bring to life classic horror stories, some you're definitely familiar with, and others you'll be hearing for the first time. Join me as I tuck you into bed with stories that will leave you sleepless all night long. Get new episodes of Nighty Night every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on the Prosecutors, why are so many women going missing in a small area of British Columbia? and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my Requena co-host, Alice. Wow. I, I like don't even know. Is that a British Columbian word? Because it's beautiful. No, it's Galatian, which I don't really know where Galatia is, but it's Galatian, and it means nice or cute, but it's something you'd say about a person you admire and cherish. He was equally lovable and loving. That's, That's so nice. Galatian, like like the book of the Bible. So I like have no in... idea. It <laughs> I mean, looks and sounds like Spanish to me. So I'm thinking maybe there's like something like that. Maybe not Middle East, perhaps more of the European descent. Either way, good job saying that. Fantastic. I'm very proud of you. And I also know that all of those nice things you just said were not from your head, but from some wonderful listener. So mm. listener, thank you for saying nice things because Brett can't bear to say nice things about me. <laughs> I didn't write down who it is, but you know who you are, and thank you for sharing that. And I need all the words I can get, so if you have words you have for Alice, superlatives, describing her appropriately, please let me know. Well, okay, that's enough chit-chat. For those who leave all the one-star reviews hating chit-chat, don't worry, I'm cutting it off today. And I'm doing it for a good reason, though, because we are covering a number of cases today, and I want to make sure that we have enough time to get to all of them. Because when we covered the Highway of Tears, the saddest part I think that came out of that case for me was that we barely hit the tip of the iceberg on missing women in Canada. And there, this is not just in Canada, this is all over the world. And some listeners kind of brought our attention to additional women's cases that needed to be covered. And I'm really glad we're able to do that today, Brett. Yes, and what's interesting about this, the Highway of Tears is both well known and the issue there is long standing. It's over decades. We're covering fewer people today. We're gonna talk about five cases today, but they all happened in a very short period of time. We're talking February, 2016, to September 2017, and all in an area that's about a 75-kilometer stretch between Vernon and Sycamus in British Columbia. We are returning to Canada, and, and these women have been dubbed the missing women of North Okanagan Shushwap. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> Who knows? But it's a case we wanted to cover, like Alice was saying, and we got such a positive or so much positive feedback on the Highway of Tears, we were a little worried about not being able to dedicate an entire episode to one case. We got so much positive feedback, we decided to do it more because we just see this so often where there are cases that there's so little known about them, you could never do an entire episode. And we wanted to be able to give these ladies some airtime in the hopes that for those who are still missing, for those who it's unclear exactly what happened, whatever little we can do, we want to do. So 
we hope that this is a something you're you know you're going to enjoy in the way we enjoy true crime and hopefully can bring some more attention to these cases because they need it and I mean, that's sort of the thing. When you're having to do five cases on one episode of a podcast, that tells you the cases have not gotten as much attention as you would like because there's just not that much out there about them. Like I said, we're going to Canada and we're going to British Columbia. British Columbia is Canada's third largest province. It occupies about 9.5% of the country's total area. So why is it that people seem to go missing in British Columbia at rates far higher than any other province in the country? According to Capital Daily, which is one of the newspapers in the area, in 2020, British Columbia accounted for more than 40% of the nation's total missing persons cases involving adults. There's a lot of thoughts about why that is. We're going to talk about some of that later, but for the most part, we're going to focus on these cases. In today's story, we will be discussing the cases of five women who went missing or were murdered in British Columbia's North Okanagan region over the span of about 20 months between 2016 and 2017. Caitlin Potts, Ashley Simpson, Deanna Wirtz, Tracy Genero, and Nicole Bell. And I do want to thank Madison, who is our research assistant, and she is very passionate about these kind of cases. And she's really good at doing exactly what we wanted to do here, which is finding stuff about a lot of different cases and bringing it together. So we're really happy to have her along and really thankful for the work she did on this outline. Absolutely. If not for her, I don't think we'd have the time to cover a lot of these cases. So thank you, Madison. And let's go ahead and dive in, Brett, because these are such devastating cases. And I really hope that they are solved for the victims, but also for their loved ones. So the first one we're talking about today is Caitlin Potts. She was just 27 years old when she was last heard of on February 22nd, 2016. Caitlin, who is a member of the Samson Cree First Nation, has not been heard or seen since that day when she last corresponded with her sister Cody on Facebook. Caitlin told Cody that she had, quote, found a ride on Kijiji to Calgary. And Kijiji is this local classified ad site in Canada and that she would be coming back tonight for sure. But Caitlin, unfortunately, never did return that evening. On March First, 2016, Caitlin was reported missing to the RCMP, but they did not post an official alert regarding her disappearance until nearly three weeks later on March 21st, 2016. And really not much happened in the case at all. It was a standstill. And more than a year later, in May 2017, the RCMP released surveillance footage of Caitlin walking into the Orchard Place Mall in Kalauna, British Columbia. And this is believed to be the last known sighting of Caitlin. There's a couple things that jump out to me immediately on that. The first one is something that we have talked about repeatedly. And we see again where someone is reported missing and it takes a very long time for the police to take it seriously. Here she is reported missing on March 1st. And it seems like the police didn't really take it seriously until March 21st. That's 20 days. That's a long time. And we're going to talk about one of the reasons that may be. But nevertheless, that's a lot of time you've lost. Then I've got to wonder about the surveillance footage. They released it in May of 2017. I have a hard time believing they found it then. Just as we've talked about before, surveillance footage is not kept for very long. Even in today's environment where, you know, we don't have the problem with tape or whatever. I mean, that's over a year. So it's hard for me to believe that someone that late saw that and recognized her. It it almost makes me think, They had that for a while and and for some reason kind of held it back. And then only when it was a year later, decided to release it. And we talked about the importance of holdback evidence before. I get it. But I just feel like when you have these missing persons cases, if you got the evidence, you need to put it out there. And maybe they didn't have it. I mean, maybe this mall kept this footage for over a year. And somehow after a year, somebody looked at it and figured it out. But... It certainly raises questions to me. Now, one of the problems in this case, and maybe one of the reasons that it took police so long to get involved in this, is Caitlin, you know, we talk about this victimology sometimes. And we talk about 
the things that you see again and again in these cases that make it difficult to solve them and sometimes lead to these delays in policing. We're not even sure exactly where Caitlin was living at the time of her disappearance. Now, it's speculated that she was living in Enderby, British Columbia with her off-again, on-again boyfriend, Jason. Now, he publicly denies this claim. He says they weren't living together. They had had a very tumultuous relationship, and Jason had been found guilty of assaulting Caitlin following an incident in 2014. There's also speculation that she may have been living in the Salmon Arm area with a female roommate she had met while staying at a woman's shelter in the area. And this goes back to what we've talked about before. When people are transient, when they don't have a home, they don't have people who are looking out for them, they don't have people who will miss them, a lot of times... These are the people who, when they disappear, it is so hard to solve the disappearance because the delay in knowing they're missing and having any idea of who they're hanging out with and who they're around, the likely suspects in a case like this, can make it really hard to get to the bottom of these cases. And a couple of things that jump out already is that she has spent at least some time at a woman's shelter, likely meaning that she didn't have a stable place to live, or at least there was some period in her life where she didn't have stable housing, whether it was because she was having a tumultuous relationship with a potentially abusive boyfriend, or she was just between roommates. But not only that, we also see that her last communication with her sister was about having to find a ride meaning likely that she didn't have her own reliable source of transportation. And we may be just seeing snippets of this. All we know from this kind of short story of where she is is that at one point she was asking for a ride. At another point, she is staying in a woman's shelter. There are probably many, many, many other instances where she's doing things that put her in a vulnerable position. That probably wasn't the first ride she'd ever found on some classified ad site. She probably took many rides like that, especially if she's messaging her sister about it. You know, she didn't ask her sister for a ride, for example, for whatever reason, maybe her sister wasn't nearby, her sister didn't have transportation of her own, what have you. But what this suggests to me is that she probably had other vulnerable times in her life. And this just happened to be one that perhaps ended poorly. And there are two things I think you can say about this. The first one is, obviously, As we all know, classified websites can be predators' hunting ground. We've seen this in LISC. It is very easy to put something like this on the classified site, use it to lure in someone, get them in a position where you have total control of them, over them. They're in your car. What are they going to do? And then murder them. We see people who do this. The other possibility is that it's a signal of what happened later. Maybe that ride was perfectly legitimate. They gave her a ride to the mall. They drove on home, never thought about her again, moved on with their lives, but she had to get home. And so maybe on the way home, she's hitchhiking. And as we talked about on the Highway of Tears, hitchhiking can be dangerous. And unfortunately, there's a possibility that she just got in the wrong car with the wrong person and that her disappearance is a result of that. And to this day, there's not much known about her whereabouts. She has never been found. Her body has never been found. This is a case where you wonder about something like sex trafficking because she is someone who is sort of in a transigent state, much more easy to take advantage of someone like her. But one thing we know for certain is the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, they have confirmed that they believe there was foul play in this case. Now, they have not pointed to any evidence about that, but I think they're playing the odds. I think they look at this case, they look at what happened, and they think there's no reason to think this lady just decided to move on and start a new life somewhere. This seems like foul play, and I think it probably was. So, Caitlin is described by her sister as an outgoing and bubbly person that she made everyone around her feel comfortable and happy. She is approximately 5 feet 3 inches tall, 150 pounds, with brown eyes and long black hair with blonde streaks. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Vernon RCMP at 250-545-7171 or anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-888-222-8477. Seven. And I just, I do want to note that her disappearance, the date of her disappearance was February 22nd, 
2016. And I wish we had more information to do a longer episode on her, but unfortunately, that's all we have. And hopefully this sparks some, you know, memory for someone who was maybe in the area, who maybe saw something and can offer information that can help solve her case, and maybe even find her. But since that's all we have, let's talk about another woman who unfortunately met a similar fate, and that's Ashley Simpson. She was only 32 years old when she disappeared after leaving the travel trailer she shared with her boyfriend on Yankee Flats Road right outside of Salmon Arm. On the evening of April 27, 2016, Ashley and her boyfriend Derek Favel had engaged in a loud argument over money. And this prompted Ashley to leave the couple's home, and she was later spotted walking along the street in Silver Creek, a neighboring town with her pink suitcase. The following morning around 7.30 a.m., two text messages were sent from Ashley's phone to her boyfriend, letting him know that their relationship was over and she would be returning to her parents' home in Ontario. And you know she's going to go missing, and you know there's a boyfriend. And you know they got in a fight. So, to me, there's a lot of red flags that are going up all over the place. As we all know, when something happens to a woman, the first place you look is a significant other. And and we're going to see that's going to happen in this case. The text messages are interesting because they're one of two things. They're either legitimate or it's the boyfriend covering up the murder he committed. So she was reported missing a few days later on April 30th, but little information came in related to her disappearance. The first piece of evidence came in October 2016 when her ID was found in the tank of a sewage vacuum truck. Not a good sign. But, and this was interesting just reading about this, it speculated that she may have lost the ID prior to it going missing. Apparently she had had her wallet stolen at some point. So there's actually a thought that just whoever stole her wallet that was going through it and just throwing stuff, you know, basically like in the sewer system or whatever and took the money and and went. And it was just a coincidence that her ID ended up there. Now, the police, they tried to do some sort of fingerprints on the ID, but basically they said so many people had touched the ID, which this is not surprising, right? I mean, think about how many people touch your ID, particularly if you're having to give it to people for whatever reason, that they actually couldn't, they couldn't do anything with it. So the ID was, was basically a dead end. And at this point, the investigation stalled, but then there was a devastating discovery on December 6th, 2021, five years after her disappearance. Detectives, They got a tip from an unknown source, which is an interesting thing. There are a lot of questions in this case. We're going to follow up with this case because there's a lot of things we don't know that hopefully we'll know soon. But the way it's described in the reporting is they got a tip from an unknown source, which doesn't sound like what we typically see, which is your blackberry pickers or your hunters or your hikers. They get this tip that there is a body in an unknown location. The location has actually not been disclosed. The detectives go to the area, and there they find Ashley's remains. At this point, Ashley's boyfriend, Derek Favel, who's 39 years old at the time, was charged with second-degree murder. He was denied bail and remains in custody until his trial begins. Now, the timing of this has not yet been determined. It was supposed to begin in October. But as we record this, it's October 23rd, and they still haven't set the trial date. They began jury selection in September, and apparently in Canada, jury selection takes a month. So (laughs) the jury selection was expected to take 30 days. I don't know if it just hasn't ended or what. Like I said, they have not issued a trial date. All this may sound very strange to those of you who are listening in the United States where we know everything about everything on every case that ever happens. Not so in Canada. There is a publication ban on this case. And so there's basically no information has been released to the public. And we have no idea what the evidence is in this case against Derek. And we won't know until the trial begins. What's interesting about this case, though, look, I play statistics too. I'm sure the police have evidence. It seems like they were just waiting on a body. But 
What's interesting about this case is her disappearance is only a couple months after the disappearance of Caitlin Potts. Caitlin disappeared in February, late February. She disappeared in April. They're right around the same area. Salmon Arm is going to come up a lot as we're talking about these cases. If I'm the boyfriend, the argument I'm going to be making is she was witnessed walking down the road with her bag. So she wasn't murdered at home. And then he just said she left. She actually did leave. And she got some distance away. Now, the text messages are interesting because they happened the next day. And you would think, you would think if anything happened to her, it would have happened that night. You wouldn't think she would make it somewhere, send the text messages the next morning, and then something happened to her. He may have done that to sort of cover for himself, and it may end up backfiring against him. I think this is a really interesting case. I'm looking forward to the trial. I'm looking forward to seeing what else is going to come up. But if I'm the boyfriend... I'm I'm seriously considering that my defense is going to be it wasn't me it's whoever is preying on women in this area. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought about the defense and just lest you listening think that there are a lot of ties here I do have to note though the fact that the text message mentions where her parents live I think really cuts against kind of a stranger situation because if it wasn't her who sent the message, right? Because it went into enough detail. Typically, if it's a stranger, you'll see something more vague, like I'm going to go to my favorite place. What's your favorite place? You know, we don't know. But here there is the mention of Ontario, which I think is very interesting. And also, I want to note one other thing. We don't know anything about this anonymous tip right now. Hopefully, when trial starts, we'll know a little bit more. But if this was done by one person, and so far, one person has been charged with her death. And so it appears that there's one perpetrator. Even with one person who's not working in conjunction with someone else to commit a crime, it's very difficult for people to stay silent. It's likely that the anonymous tip heard either from him or the perpetrator bragging about what happened and called in this tip, which is what led authorities to her body. I say that because a lot of episodes we talk about how difficult it is to keep a conspiracy and quiet. If there's more than two people involved, someone's going to talk. Even sometimes when there's one person, it's hard to keep quiet so much more when there are more people. So I'd be interested to see kind of how this anonymous tip person found out. Yet, if that anonymous tip was not the person who's charged why the police don't think that person has something to do with it. No, I think that's a great point. And like I said, I think I think this is going to be an interesting one. We're going to keep watching it. Wouldn't shock me if you're right. If the tip is more than just, I saw a body, but is, is much more detailed than that. Because, I mean, look, it had been five years since she had disappeared. The amount of evidence, I mean, maybe there was. I mean, maybe there was something obvious at the, at the scene where she was dumped. But usually... You have a body, but you're not going to find a lot more. There's not going to be a lot more to help you out. So the fact that they so quickly were able to arrest him either means they already had a lot and they just they just wanted to prove that she was actually she'd actually died. Or like you said, the tip is more than just that's where her body is. It was also and I know who did it. Right. So we're going to be following that. I'm going to be very interested to see what comes out in trial or if it gets resolved before trial with a plea. We shall see. But let's continue to talk about some women. And the next one, Deanna Wirtz. We actually have to thank League Said for reaching out to us about Deanna's case because it was actually looking into Deanna's case that led us to the fact that so many women seem to be missing in this particular area. And now Deanna is a little bit older than the last two women that we talked about. She was 46 when she disappeared. Not even three months after Ashley Simpson was reported missing, a woman living on the same road as Ashley also seemingly vanished. Deanna Wirtz was last seen on July 19th, 2016, at her home on Yankee Flats Road, that same road that, remember, Ashley was walking down when she was last seen. Deanna let her husband know that she would be heading out for a hike at a nearby mountain, something she often did. It was raining, but that apparently didn't stop Deanna. However, when her husband returned home from work that evening, Deanna was nowhere to be found. 
He initially assumed that Deanna was still out hiking, but soon discovered that their dog was wandering down the road from their home, which was uncharacteristic. This was strange for the dog and for Deanna to let her dog be out there, and it sparked instant concern since Deanna was typically with her dog on her hikes. And look, I get it. We just talked about Ashley's case. It probably is the boyfriend. It's usually the boyfriend. But man, I mean, it's striking that you have these two women who live on the same road who went missing within such a short time period. I mean, that is that is something that catches your attention. Now, it could be a coincidence. It probably is a coincidence, but it's something that makes you think. And, and I assume the police would have looked into this fact. We're going to talk about later. It's interesting that all these women are so different. So we're, we're pointing out the things that they have in common, but they do have some, some differences. As Alice just pointed out, she's a little bit older than the first two women we talked about. She's married. She's not in sort of an unstable situation. She has a home. She's doing a routine thing, walking her dog. And when her husband finds the dog, I mean, it does cause him concern. Though I got to say, it must it must not have caused too much concern because there's one weird thing about this case. And I tried to nail down whether this is accurate. And it seems like it is. It seems like she she absolutely went missing on July 19th. But she wasn't reported missing until July 22nd, which is not the next day or the next day. It's the next day. And and if that's wrong, I want somebody to write us in and point it out. Because that, to me, was just a strange thing. Three days is a long time to wait to call someone in. Now, something that's interesting about this. We talked about earlier, you have sort of a transient person, a member of the First Nations who goes missing. It takes the RCMP three weeks to even list her as missing. Well, they don't wait here. Instead, they quickly launch a massive seven-day search. They employed ground teams, all-terrain vehicles, service dogs, helicopters, drones. They are going all out looking for her. And they are covering basically an eight-square-kilometer area of wilderness surrounding where she lived and the areas where she was known to go when she would go on these hikes. They're giving it everything they got. They don't find anything. They don't find any trace of her. And in fact, to this day, we have no idea what happened to Deanna. She's not been heard from since. At the time of her disappearance, though, despite this search, or maybe this is actually related to the search, the RCMP, they said they don't suspect foul play. So on these earlier ones, they obviously did. They did suspect foul play, and they let us know that. But they haven't given us any particular evidence to support that. But there is one thing to note. According to Deanna's brother, Dale, she had been depressed. And in fact, she had called a suicide hotline just before she disappeared. And you have to wonder if there's some connection there between what the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are saying and this thought about foul play. And we've talked about this before. We talked about it in the Maura Murray case. Sometimes that fact can end up being really detrimental to an investigation because the police can really latch onto it. And Maura Murray, her father said something about her possibly committing suicide, and that became what the police thought. She walked off into the wilderness to commit suicide. We really didn't think that's what she did. I don't think that's what she did. But because he said that, they sort of latched onto it. And I kind of wonder if the reason they don't suspect foul play is the same thing. She was depressed, so that must have been what happened. You know, this isn't the result of some serial killer operating in the area or anything untoward. She just decided she was going to walk off that night with her dog, leave the dog behind, and go off to die somewhere, I guess, is the theory. Or it could have been an accident. She was going on a hike. Something could have happened. Some sort of interaction with wildlife. The dog just runs back home. These are all possibilities, though, as we said, the fact that she is one of several women in a very small area, and in fact, living on the same road is one of the women we mentioned before. I would certainly like the police to look into this case, maybe with a little bit more aggression. Now, Deanna was last known to be wearing a gray t-shirt and gray cut-off sweatpants. She is five feet, two inches tall. She weighs about 120 pounds with dark hair and brown eyes. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Deanna Wirtz, 
please call the local police or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. This episode of The Prosecutors is brought to you by Huggies Little Movers. Huggy knows that babies come in all shapes and sizes, and their tushies do too. Huggies best-fitting diaper is their Little Movers with its curved and stretchy fit. Moms know that there's nothing worse than an ill-fitting diaper, especially for your active babies. I love Huggies because I can rely on them to keep my baby covered while she moves around. You guys have been with me as baby brettany has been born, and now she is starting to crawl. And I just love these Huggies because they keep everything contained, but they also allow her to be the active baby she is. Guys, we are covered up with babies on this podcast, and we're so glad to have Huggies. I don't know what we would do without them. Huggies Little Movers are curved, so my babies feel comfy no matter how much they're moving around and they are moving around a lot they also offer up to 12 hour protection against leaks which is a game changer get your baby's butt into huggy's best fitting diaper huggy's little movers we got you baby the prosecutors is brought to you by progressive insurance hey guys whether you love true crime or comedy celebrity interviews news or even motivational speakers you call the shots and what's in your podcast queue right and guess what Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you. Fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the name your price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. I mean, here's the thing, Brett, when we, you know, first started looking into these cases, these five separate cases, I was like, well, they're all so different. They have different fact patterns. It is so strange for them to all be so close together in such a short amount of time, even if they don't ultimately have something to do with each other. It's like there's a curse on this area. Or alternatively, it's like when you start looking for the red car on the road, you start seeing it. And That's even scarier, right? The fact that there are all these disappearances, murders in all areas of our world. And if you start looking closely there, they may not necessarily just be concentrated. This is only a concentration in location because we're looking at this location. But when you extrapolate out to kind of all of British Columbia or all of Canada or all of North America and all the other places that we've looked You're seeing this. And in fact, this might just be a microcosm of what's happening at a greater scale. And that's a little bit too big for me to chew off tonight. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that is that is as disturbing as it is to talk about these individual cases, to think that if you looked at any, you know, basically year period in any area, you could find something like this is even more disturbing. But we'll continue. What we're still going on. But basically what I'm trying to say, fellow ladies, is that oftentimes when you see these, There are a lot of women who are going missing and who are being murdered. No surprise, guys. We are oftentimes the victims. And just note, the the five that we're covering, at least today, massive range of ages and station in life. I think the takeaway so far is at least don't let your guard down. You don't just have to be the 18-year-old transient who is at risk. You could be the established 40-something-year-old with a home and, you know, a happy marriage and dog. And you could be in a similar situation as well. And that brings us to Tracy Genero. So Tracy was only 18 years old when she disappeared from Vernon, British Columbia on May 29th, 2017. The victimology on Tracy is pretty straightforward. She had dealt with a lot of instability in her home life growing up. And she suffered with a drug addiction in her teen years. And in fact, she had relied on sex work to make money to support her heroin addiction. The thing is, about the time she disappeared, she had seemed to be turning her life around. Her father reported that she had, in fact, stopped using drugs. She was volunteering at the local SPCA. And this was a great opportunity for her as she was a huge animal lover and it was something that she wanted to do. So getting this experience could have been the start for her to really turn her life around and 
get out of this bad situation that she had been in. Unfortunately, Tracy wouldn't get the chance to pursue this for very long because on May 29th, Tracy's friend Bob Zimmerman saw her get into a white van outside of the Vernon Bottle Deposit in Vernon, British Columbia. And this is the last known sighting of Tracy alive. Sometime after, Tracy's father reported her missing to the RCMP, and he claimed that he had reported her missing three times before his concerns were taken seriously and her disappearance publicized. I haven't found any reason to doubt what he said, and if that is true, it seems to fit what we've seen before with police. They kind of go with statistics, and the statistics of a young 18-year-old who's an adult, so, you know, she doesn't have to report to her parents where she is, has at least had a history of drug use and also of sex work, not show up or answer her father's phone calls. They may just think she's just using, you know, substances with friends somewhere or not wanting to answer her dad's calls. So it's very possible that he did try to report her missing, although three times is a lot of times to not be taken seriously if that is in fact what happened. Unfortunately, there is not going to be a happy ending for Tracy. On October 21st, 2017, Tracy Genero's remains were found on a farm on Salmon River Road, a road that you guys unfortunately are now very familiar with in today's episode. And this was in Silver Creek. An autopsy was performed, but the results have not been made public. The RCMP have called Tracy's death suspicious, but have not confirmed if foul play was involved. And so far, no arrests have been made related to her death. Now, one quick note. Even though we know from her father that she had started to turn her life around, I just want to note that the things that she was apparently, you know, turning her life around from are not typically about face situations. Typically, people who face drug addiction who may be wanting to get clean and are on a road to get clean, it's not typically an about face or a linear path to success, right? There are typically fallbacks. There's falling back into your old habits. And when you do fall back into your old habits, especially with drug addiction, you need some way to pay for it. And if she had done sex work before, you can see how she may have had previous clients that she still had contact with that that she may still be at least perceived by some in the outside world as being in that profession. I don't say that to know anything about where she was in her path of turning her life around, but I note that even though we know from her dad that she was turning her life around and how amazing that is, that those aspects of her life may have still been around. And that may be important because of where she was found. You see, Tracy's remains were found on a 24-acre property that was owned by Evelyn Ruth Sagmoen and Wayne Thomas Sagmoen. Now, the public have speculated that the Sagmoen's son, Curtis Sagmoen, may have been involved in Tracy's death. And they think that because Curtis has been convicted of a long list of violent crimes, most of which were targeted at sex workers. Most notably, Curtis ran into a woman with an ATV in 2017. It didn't stop there. He then assaulted another woman in 2019. And he, at another time, pointed a gun at another woman also in 2019. So he kind of has this long list of different, just violent behaviors. But to date, Curtis has not been charged in relation to Tracy's death. And I do note those assaults that he's been charged with, they're serious, but none of them ended with anyone murdered. And so there are people who are violent and do terrible things that escalate up to murder, but it is, you know, pointing a gun at someone, pretty bad, by the way, you should never point a gun at someone, but he didn't pull the trigger in that situation. Here we have, we don't know how she died, but we we know that we at least have a, a death here. And I say that because There hasn't been any charges brought here, and my hope is that the investigation will lead to some sort of resolution on her behalf. Now, because of the Sagmoans' property's proximity to this rash of disappearances, much suspicion has fallen on Curtis, but again, no evidence has tied him to Tracy or any of the other vanishings. But this hasn't stopped the families from rallying at the Sagmoans' property together to seek more attention for their loved ones' cases. 
Tracy's family would like her to be remembered as a happy, giggly young woman with a caring nature and a beautiful smile. And if you have any information regarding Tracy's death, please contact the local police. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have a lot of suspicion about Curtis. We talked about how all of these people lived very close to each other. Some of them lived on the same road. Now you have a body appearing on this property, and you have someone who has a history of violence. There's a reason people have jumped to these conclusions. But there have been there's been a lot of pressure, I think, on the RCMP to look into this. As Alice said, there have been... You can find press where the families of all these women that we're talking about have come together and gone to that property because they have a lot of suspicion about Curtis. I think the police have probably looked at him, but you never know. I mean, look, he's the kind of guy, when you talk about wrongful convictions, for instance, somebody like Curtis, kind of guy who, who can be wrongfully convicted because he's kind of a scumbag. He's the local, you know, round up the usual suspects type guy, right? Something happens to a woman in this area. Where was Curtis? Was he around? Right? So you can imagine this is not the kind of person who if the police had really any evidence would probably hesitate to start moving on. So while he is attractive as a suspect for a lot of reasons, and I'm not saying that he's not involved, I do think it's probably less fruitful than we would like to think. And that brings us to our final victim that we're going to talk about today, Nicole Bell. Nicole was 31 when she disappeared on September 2nd, 2017. And this happened a little over three months after Tracy went missing. And you have, yet again, tragedy is striking this area. Now, Nicole was a mother of three. She made a Facebook post on September 2nd, 2017, and she hasn't been seen or heard from since. She was reported missing five days later on September 7th. And she was last known to be at her home in Sycamus, British Columbia. Because of all this, little is known about the circumstances of Nicole's disappearance. She just sort of was there one moment and gone the next. One thing, though, her phone was discovered in Salmon Arm, which we've talked about repeatedly. But this doesn't seem to have led to any further discoveries. The one thing I will note is if you find somebody's phone... It's a bad sign. You know how it is. Phones are basically attached to you now. As Heather Ashley says, you know, if your phone's off, you're either being murdered or you're committing a murder. I think it's the same thing where if you find somebody's phone, that is not a good sign. It's now been almost five years since Nicole vanished. Her family does not believe that she would have voluntarily left her three children, whom by all accounts she loves dearly. We talk about this whenever somebody disappears, there's always this thought, maybe they left on their own. I'm a big fan of, unless there's some actual evidence that they might do that, that is not something you really should even consider because all it does is delay you. And to this date, given that we don't know what happened to her, there's been nobody, obviously no one has been charged in connection with her disappearance. Nicole is remembered by those who love her as being kind and pleasant, she loved the outdoors, she was very energetic, and she was a super mom to her three children. She is four foot eleven with blonde hair and blue eyes. She has a piercing in her nose and above her lip. Anyone with information about the whereabouts of Nicole is asked to contact the Sycamus, RCMP, or Crime Stoppers. Oh, just the utter lack of information in that case is so difficult. Like, there's not much more we can go off of. So I hope that someone knows something and contacts the police. So are there connections between these cases that we talked about today? The missing women of the northern Okanagan region seem to be inextricably linked online. You can't find an article about one case that doesn't mention the other four. Understandably, locals have been left to wonder if a serial killer may be to blame for all these disappearances. But aside from the general area and time frame, like we talked about earlier, there's little evidence to suggest that these cases are actually related. The women share very few similarities other than their location. Their appearances, age, lifestyle, and circumstances of their disappearances all vary greatly. Honestly, if they were in separate locations, I would never think to talk about them in one episode. There doesn't seem to be any evidence that these women even knew each other, because you can imagine if they ran in the same circle, goals. That may indicate some sort of foul play. And although Deanna Wirtz and Ashley Simpson were neighbors, but there's no indication that the two had met. 
remains have only been found in two of the five cases. We know Ashley Simpson, her boyfriend, was charged with second-degree murder in connection with her death with a pending trial. Tracy Genero, though the RCMP calls her death suspicious, they haven't gone so far as to confirm that she was a victim of homicide. And the other three, of course, are still missing persons cases. The RCMP does not suspect foul play in Deanna Wirtz's disappearance. And foul play is suspected in Caitlin's Potts' disappearance. But it's worth noting that she and her boyfriend had a very tumultuous relationship with documented instances where he abused her. Now, little is known about Nicole Bell's disappearance. So it's difficult to link this to the other cases in any way aside from the location. Now, look, location matters. And although it is ordinarily the case, if you have a serial killer, they do tend to have a type. They do tend to target a certain type of person. They tend to do it in the same way. You know, you see serial killers who, who use online things or who pick up hitchhikers or who only murder sex workers. But that doesn't mean you couldn't have someone who was a little bit more indiscriminate, who was murdering people from a certain area. And it didn't really matter who they were. It was just opportunity. Take Deanna Wirtz. It's possible if you had a serial killer who was operating in that area that they just happened to see her by herself at night in the rain and took advantage of that opportunity. That is a possibility, but that would be, it would be striking. That would be a serial killer you would know about if they were ever caught because they would be kind of different from what you expect. The fact that these women were in such different circumstances is pretty strong evidence that these aren't connected. Nevertheless, it is strange. It is strange that you see five women disappear, some of them in very mysterious circumstances, all within a short period of time, all from this one small area. And that sort of raises this bigger question, why do so many women disappear in British Columbia? And why are so many of these disappearances unsolved to this day? And this is actually a question that has puzzled Canadian officials for decades. If you look at British Columbia, we've picked a microcosm of this. Like Alice said, we've picked a year. We talked about five women. If you keep going back, you're going to find more and more. Some people say, look, it's the topography. It's made up of dense forests, lakes, mountains, and ocean, which make it difficult to find people once they go missing or even pinpoint a location to search. It also opens up the possibility of sort of accident or animal predation, something unrelated to foul play that maybe would make it even harder to figure out why these people have disappeared, but hasn't gone unnoticed. And in fact, in 2022, the RCMP announced a new initiative that would enable them to use advanced satellite technology to detect locations where human remains may have been discarded, partially buried, or hidden in shallow graves. Now, it has not been revealed what cases may be investigated under this initiative. This is a new advancement that everyone hopes will help bring closure to families of missing people across Canada, perhaps maybe even some of those mentioned in this episode. And again, if you have any information relating to any of the missing women we've talked about today or anyone, please contact local law enforcement or Crime Stoppers. And thank you guys for bringing these women to our attention so that we can at least give them some sort of airtime and hopefully reach someone who knows something. And this is a good example of, we always say email us, and that's exactly what happened here. We got an email from somebody who wanted us to look at Deanna Wirtz's case, and when we did, the first thing we saw was not a whole lot, very little, but very quickly we discovered there are all these sort of tangentially related cases and we realized hey this is something we can do and so we did do it so hopefully if you're out there and you're aware of cases like this don't ever let the fact there's not a lot of information stop you from at least reaching out it may be the case that we can't do it and it may be the case that we just can't figure out a way to build an episode around it but sometimes we can and we want to do that look we're we love talking about the famous cases we love talking about the controversial cases that's a lot of fun But these cases mean a lot to us as well, and we want to do these, and it is so helpful to have people. We never would have known about this case, ever, if someone didn't reach out to us. So let us know. We're happy to look at these cases, and I really appreciate all of you. Alice, do you want to do some questions? 
Definitely do. Definitely do. Okay, let's do let's do a positive one. I'll do positive ones. This one's from Madison. Madison says, I just started in a law enforcement career. Any advice for a rookie? First of all, congratulations. I, I think going into law enforcement is an incredible sacrifice for your career, and it takes a special person to want to do that and to enter that profession. So first of all, congratulations, and thank you for what you're doing. The second thing to do is to... It's easier said than done, but not to get jaded. You're going to see a lot. You're going to probably, you know, hear a lot of things about yourself or about law enforcement that's going to be negative. Don't be jaded by it. Remember why you went into the profession to help people and that there are going to be good people who appreciate what you have to do. And there are people who need you. And for you to do your best job, you need to be able to have fresh eyes to look at every case. It's easy to look at yet another missing person case, for example, and think that's just another runaway. You know, try to keep that perspective and use your critical thinking skills with each new case that comes before you so that you can do the best for your case, but also so that you don't get burnout. When you remember the real human lives behind each of your cases, I think it's, you know, it, it fuels you through those really tough times that are stressful, that are long nights, that are, you know, much more work than you ever thought you signed up for. But when it's a difference in another human being's life. It, it really makes it all worth it. Yeah. And I think that is so important to focus on because it is hard to be in law enforcement these days. It is really hard. It is popular to bash you. It is popular to, to drag you down. And you're going to hear that criticism all the time. And you have to remember the people you're helping. What you do is so important. And so many people rely on you. And a lot of them are never able to say thank you to you. So you're going to hear the criticism, but you're not going to hear the praise. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is related to that, but it is unfair. But you're not only held to a high or higher standard, you're basically held to an impossible standard, but you have to try and reach it because you represent every other person in law enforcement and you have to be an ambassador for the good that law enforcement does for every person you meet. And it's so hard to do that when you're working long hours and you're constantly getting berated. It is so hard to maintain that attitude, but you have to do it. You have to do it because policing cannot be done by police alone. We talk about this a lot. If communities don't trust the police, if the police and communities are not working together, you'll never solve crimes. And the worst thing is, usually the communities that don't trust the police are the ones where the worst crimes are happening. And it's so frustrating because you want to take the bad guys out of those communities, but it's so hard to do it when you don't have the support of the community. But those communities have legitimate reasons for why they don't trust you. And you are on the front line of that. If anyone's going to change it, it has to be you, and it starts with you. So that is, that's a heavy burden to have, but it's one you carry with you every single day, whether you want to or not. Okay, so this is an easy one, kind of. This is from Closing 15. This is a legal question. When we are entitled to a speedy trial, do defendants have the option to waive that right? The simple answer is yes. The more complicated answer is no. <laughs> and the reason for that is the speedy trial right, it doesn't just belong to the defendant. It actually belongs to the community. Everyone, the entire community has has an interest in speedy trials. So it is not as simple as the defendant says, I waive my speedy trial right, and then you can take as long as you want. Typically, at least under the federal slash constitutional system, states have different rules. The judge has to find that it's actually in the interest of justice to waive it. Now, usually if you say, hey, I need more time, my counsel needs more time to get ready for this trial, it's very complicated, that's going to be enough. So it's usually seen as the defendant waiving it. Obviously, the prosecution can't waive it. But it is a bigger question than just, are you willing to waive your speedy trial right? Okay. Let's do one more, and then we're going to be done. One more. Let's see if I can find a good one. You okay. know that I'm not fading at all because I'm worried about snakes in my house. I know. You are. <laughs> I'm good to go. I'm so never sleeping again. That's a tough question, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna answer that one yet. No, no tough questions after a double header. Okay, okay. I'm gonna get another advice one. We'll do another advice one. Okay. I like the advice ones; they're nice. And and this one's really for you, Alice, because you've done more of this than I have. 
Okay, so I guess we've both done this. But anyways, this is from Elizabeth. Elizabeth wants to know, what advice do you have for a future civil litigator who hopes to include some criminal defense pro bono work in her practice? You can go first, Brett. So civil litigation is kind I mean, this is... Uh, I mean, I just I have such a there's so many types of civil, lig- litigation, of civil litigation. First of all, there's like commercial <laughs> civil litigation. There's government civil litigation. There's like family law, which is civil litigation. You know, so actually, that's the true. majority Basically, of law falls under civil, civil law. Yeah. So I, I only state that because there it's pretty broad. And so if you want to write back with like more specification, we can go to it. But I only note that for our listeners who may not know that civil law is actually like the vast majority of law and there's so many different things you could be doing you could be a plaintiff's attorney you could be a defense attorney you could be doing like you could be in trial all the time you could never be in trial you could be writing briefs all the time you could be working at a big firm you could be working a solo practice like there's so many different things you could do i think the one thing i'll say about sort of your question as a whole if you want to do pro bono criminal work that's easy because every jurisdiction needs more lawyers we just talked about we were talking about the Delphi case. And one of the problems in the Delphi case is there are no public defenders in the area. So if there's going to be a lawyer appointed in Delphi, it has to be a private attorney. And so having more people who are willing to do criminal work pro bono is a great thing. And I think you'll find it is very fulfilling, particularly depending on your civil area. I worked at a large firm as a civil litigator. I did not love it. But the pro bono work I did was so much more fulfilling. And I have friends who they will tell you the same thing. The cases they like to talk about are the pro bono cases that they picked up. Those were the interesting ones to them. You know, the criminal stuff they were doing on the side. So I would say if that's what you want to do, it's actually not hard to do it. You just have to stay committed to carving out time in your own schedule to do it. Don't lose that. Don't let how busy you're going to be rob you of the opportunity to take part in that kind of work. Yeah. With civil cases, I think, you know, a great way to stay motivated is to remember that whenever people contact lawyers in general, it's because something has gone wrong in their life, whether it's criminal or civil. And so likely that legal case for your client is going to be the most important thing happening in their life. And that type of compassion and recognition of how big this is in your client's life is really helpful because it keeps perspective into what you're doing. It helps you relate to the importance of the work you're doing. And I love the kind of mix of civil and criminal. Both Brett and I have done civil and criminal law. I think it gives you different perspectives, both into civil cases and criminal cases. We've talked about this a lot in terms of advice of how to become a better lawyer or, you know, what you should do to prepare for law school. And we always say, get more life experiences because being a lawyer is being able to issue spot and being able to make connections that may not be obvious on their face. By practicing both civil and criminal, you're getting to view different aspects of the law and it's still the law. You're able to draw analogies from civil to criminal and vice versa in the way you relate to certain clients and vice versa. You know, again, just because it's not a criminal case doesn't mean it's not the most important thing happening in that person's life. And also there are civil cases that feel criminal and there are criminal cases that feel procedural, right? Or or feel like they shouldn't be criminal. So it would be a great perspective to be able to be that attorney who can kind of draw in those experiences from both for the betterment of your client, no matter if it's on the civil side or the criminal side. All right, guys. Well, that's all we got for tonight. If you got more questions, leave those five-star reviews. We will answer them. If you want to recommend cases, prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Prosecutorspodcast.com is our website. We post all our episodes there, and we also post our resources. So if you want to read the things that we read in preparing these episodes, it's all available on there. You should check it out out. Well, Alice, before we sign off, is there anything else you want to say? No, except thank you guys so much for bringing these cases to our attention and please continue to do so. All right. We'll be back next week with a new case, new questions, and maybe some new answers. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors.
Can I tell you about a deep fear I have today? <laughs> like, I would love is, to hear this. This is like confession hour. Okay, so remember how in the other recording I told you that we went to this like, I, I don't know what to call it. Um, Fair. Crazy rodeo. All festival, yes. All, fest all, all festival, right? And there were snakes and my kids were like handling all these snakes. These are like big pythons and stuff. I get home and I smell the air in my house and I was like, oh no, it smells like fall in my house, which means I left the door open. that a snake has crawled into my house and is hiding somewhere. Probably and I'm has. like, I've been looking like in corners, but not trying, because I'm afraid my kids now have handled all these snakes are going to see a rattlesnake and be like, oh, like, friend. Ah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so I don't know what to do. And if I found a snake, I don't know what I would do. I would probably call 911 and they'll be like, this is not an emergency, ma'am. Well, just tell them it's, it's poisonous. Yeah. Hold on to your jingle bells. Pluto TV has all your holiday favorites for free. Enjoy Christmas classics like Scrooge with Bill Murray or Last Holiday with Queen Latifah. Plus, dive into festive channels like holiday movie favorites by Lifetime or Hallmark movies and more. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming holiday favorites on live channels and on demand. With thousands of free movies and TV shows, Pluto 